Hello everyone. If you are new to OpenShot and video editing, and are looking for a tutorial that can help you get started quickly, then you've come to the right place. In this tutorial, I'm gonna first walk you through the OpenShot's user interface, menus, built-in effects, and most importantly, the powerful OpenShot clip properties. And then I'm gonna show you how to do video editing from the ground up through a complete step-by-step -step video editing exercise. By the end of this tutorial, you should be able to start your own video editing project with ease. All right, for this tutorial, I'm using OpenShot 3.1.1, which is the latest version as of September 2023. So when you start OpenShot for the first time, you should see a simple user interface layout like this one. At the very top of the window, you'll have a menu bar with five parent menu items. The file menu item contains submenus for managing the project's files and profile. The edit menu item has four submenu items, where the first two are for undoing and redoing the last action, while the last one is for setting your OpenShot's preferences or settings. The next one, the title menu item, is specifically provided for creating video title, where you can choose to create either a static text title or an animated title. While the view menu item contains some menus for arranging the user interface layout and showing or hiding the user interface elements, such as toolbar and panels. For quicker access, most of the frequently used submenu items have corresponding shortcut buttons on the toolbar. For example, this export video button is the shortcut button for the export video submenu item under the file parent menu item. Okay, now let's move on to the main window area. Right now my open shot is in so-called simple view layout, where the main window is loosely divided into three sections. The top left section by default hosts four docs or panels, the project files panel, the transitions, the effects, and the emojis panels. The project files panel is used for managing the media files of each project, such as the videos, audios, and the images that we've added to it. It has three built-in filters to show the videos only, the audios only, or the images only. These files can be shown either in details view or in thumbnail view. And if we right click any of the media files and then click the file properties, OpenShot will show you the details information of that file, as well as its video and audio formats if applicable. Then, the transitions panel lets you access the OpenShot's built-in transitions when you need to add smooth transitions between two successive clips or scenes. Similar to the transitions panel, the effects panel provides various built-in effects which you can easily add to your videos and audios in your project. For example, you can add brightness and contrast effect to your video to adjust its brightness and contrast to your preference. And lastly, the emojis panel gives you access to many built-in emojis, should you wish to add some to your video. Okay, the next panel that I want to explain is the timeline panel, which is perhaps the most important panel of all. This is where we do all the editing works, such as cutting and trimming, adding transitions, adding effects and animations, and so on. It visualizes your video project with all its clips, transitions, and effects. The timeline consists of three parent UI elements. A toolbar with a timeline zoom slider at the top. A timeline ruler. And a tracks panel. By default, OpenShot creates five tracks or layers on the timeline when you start a new project. You can easily add as many tracks as you need, or remove the existing tracks if not needed. These tracks are universal track, meaning that you can add any type of media to each of them. You can even have medias of different types on the same track. This red vertical line is called the playback line or playhead. You can move the playhead left and right simply by clicking on the desired position on the timeline ruler or drag the playhead left or right. The times shown on the timeline ruler's markings have a standard format of hour, minute, and second, while the time shown on the left end of the ruler has one more component, which is the relative frame number of the frame at the current playhead position. For example, Right now the playhead is on the 10th frame of the 5th second of the timeline. Please take note that the maximum relative frame number shown here is the video frame rate set through the project profile, which I'll explain in the later part of this tutorial. For speed and convenience in editing, the timeline panel has several tools accessible from the timeline's toolbar. It also has many other tools which we can access from both the tracks and the clips context menus. 
I'll explain these context menus in more detail later as we do the exercise. And lastly, the top right panel is the video preview panel, which as its name implies, is where we play and preview the video we are editing on the timeline. When the playback is stopped, this panel shows the video frame at the current playhead position. In addition to these six panels, OpenShot has two more panels which are not shown in the simple view mode. They are the Properties Editor panel and the Captions panel. To show all the panels, click View on the menu bar, select Views and then click Show All. All these panels, except the Timeline panel, can be shown and hidden individually. For example, to hide the Captions panel, I can simply click the cross icon at the top right corner of the panel. To show a particular panel, click View on the menu bar, select Docs, and then click the panel you want to show. Besides showing and hiding each panel individually, we can also dock each panel to other location as we wish. For example, if I want the Properties panel to be in this tab group as another tab, I can simply click and drag it over to this tab group. Lastly, I'd like to mention that OpenShot has two modes of user interface layouts, Simple View and Advanced View. The Simple View is the UI layout I've been showing you so far in this tutorial. To switch to the Advanced View, click View on the menu bar, select Views and then click Advanced View. As you can see here, in the Advanced View mode, all panels are visible and positioned such that the whole layout gives you the most convenient access to all the medias, assets and tools while editing. This advanced view, however, would only be suitable on a screen size of at least 1920 by 1080. But then again, it's all up to you which one you're most comfortable with. Personally, I prefer the simple view, because I can have the timeline occupy the whole width of the window, and also I can have a larger video preview panel. Alright, the last thing that I want to talk about in this open shot overview is the clip properties. It is very critical that you gain a good understanding on the OpenShot's clip properties before you start doing any editing. To show the clip properties, right-click the clip and then click Properties. Or if the Properties Editor panel is already shown as a tab, simply click the clip and then show the panel. As you can see here, the clip has a number of properties which are shown in alphabetical order. Most of them are editable. Only some, such as duration and end, are not. Based on their value types, loosely speaking, there are two types of properties, numeric and non-numeric properties. To change the value of a numeric property, you can either click and drag its property value bar, or double-click its value bar and then type in the desired value. To change the value of a non-numeric property, right-click the property, and then select the desired value from its context menu. In addition to this value type classification, OpenShot also classifies the clip properties into keyframe properties and non-keyframe properties. Keyframe properties are animatable, meaning that their values can be interpolated over certain part of the video to create an animation effect on the video. To see if a property is a keyframe property, right-click that property. A keyframe property will have the Insert Keyframe option on its context menu, while a non-keyframe property won't. This keyframe properties concept will become clearer, as we do the exercise later. Now let me just quickly go through some of the most commonly used properties so that you get an idea of what you can do with all those properties. The alpha property controls the transparency level of the video and image and can be used to add fade effect. The enable audio can be used to turn on and off the audio component of the video. The frame number is used to show or hide the clip or the timeline frame number on the top left corner of the video preview panel. The location properties can be used to add sliding and panning effects to the video. The origin and rotation properties can be used to add rotation or spinning effect to the video. The scale property is useful when the raw video's dimension and aspect ratio do not match those of the project profile. For example, if I change the project profile to a vertical video profile, the current video clip will be shown on the screen like this. If I were to make this video fill the entire screen, I would have to set the scale property to either crop or stretch. The next important and commonly used properties are the scale X and scale Y properties. These properties can be used to add zoom effect to the video. And lastly, the volume property can be used to control the volume level of the audio component, such as to add fade effects to the audio. 
Alright, now let's continue to the second part of this tutorial, which is a step-by-step -step guide on video editing from the ground up. 